From the Prairies to the Trenches, Part 2. From Salisbury Plain to Flanders Fields, November 1914 to December 1915. After war was declared in August, the late summer and autumn of 1914 saw a series of titanic battles rage across Europe. The Battle of the Frontiers, Tannenberg, the Marne, the Race to the Sea, and the First Battle of Ypres consumed men and material at a rate that staggered the imagination, with hundreds of thousands of men being killed or wounded. By early winter, the British expeditionary force, the Old Contemptibles, was virtually destroyed, and Great Britain was looking to its empire to help provide the replacements to maintain their frontline positions. The Canadian first contingent initially concentrated at Valcartier, Quebec, and then in October, transferred to Great Britain in what was the largest transatlantic convoy witnessed to date. When the Canadians arrived in Great Britain, they were set up in temporary camps on the Salisbury Plain. It was here where they were designated the 1st Canadian Division and began intensive training for the fighting to come. The condition in the Salisbury encampment were adequate but unseasonably wet. Of the 123 days the Canadians spent in the British encampments, it rained for 89 of them. As to the rough and tumbled Swanston brothers from Meryton, Saskatchewan, both Victor and Ernest managed to amuse themselves in the dreary camp life and spent much of their time getting into and out of trouble. November the 11th, 1914. Our sergeant, Ern, and myself were promoted today. I'm a corporal, Ern's a sergeant, and our sergeant is a sergeant major now, so we all took the boys out to the canteen to celebrate the occasion. Things were getting pretty wild around 9 p.m. The sergeant and I were getting pie-eyed, Ern was taking us back to the hut, when well, just before we went in, someone handed me a brick and bet me I couldn't knock the tin stove pipe off the hut next door. I threw the brick, missed the pipe by a mile, and sent the brick through the window. We had no sooner got in the hut when in comes our colonel, raising hell because someone hit him in the head with a brick. He came up to me and said, where's the sergeant? I told him the sergeant was out, but the colonel went right up to the sergeant's room and found him, dead to the world. Then the colonel put the whole damn hut under arrest. I thought the sergeant was likely to get it pretty heavy, so I told our captain how it all happened. The captain was a sport, and when the trial came off, he didn't call me, but said, quote, the brick was thrown by a man unknown, unquote. November 13th, 1914. Well, that's over. Ern, the sergeant, and myself are all reduced back to our old ranks. I don't give a good forgotten damn about that, but I sure hate to think of all the drinks we poured into the gang just for one night's promotion. Now, every time the bunch sees me, they all yell, Who threw the brick? While the 1st Canadian Division was training in Great Britain, back in Saskatchewan, men were enlisting for service in a growing tide as they arranged their home affairs and made sure that the crops were in. They came from all walks of life, from towns and cities to distant farms, both recent immigrants and Canadian-born, well-to-do and poor. They all filed into the recruiting centres to sign up for duty overseas. Robert Coombe, a pharmacist from the Melville area, signed up with the 27th Battalion in April 1915. A Scotsman by birth who later immigrated to Saskatchewan, Coombe felt a great sense of loyalty to the British Empire and considered it his duty to serve when war broke out. His devotion would be put to the ultimate test two years later during the spring of 1917. Dick Richardson, a young man from Grenfell, Saskatchewan, enlisted shortly after graduation from the Manitoba Agricultural College, signing up with the 4th University Company, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Jacob Miller from Newdorf, Saskatchewan, was born in Austria, but raised in Saskatchewan. As he felt a compelling need to, as he termed it, fight for king and country, he enlisted in December 1914 for active service he would find that his German background would be both a boon and a curse during his time at the front. The men were not alone in their desire to serve. The spring of 1915 saw the departure from Saskatchewan of a number of women to serve as nurses overseas, supported by Saskatchewan associations and chapters of the Red Cross, St. John's Ambulance, and the Imperial Order Daughters of the Empire. 
There was another Saskatchewan recruit who, in fact, was not even human. Vic Swanston from the Western Cavalry out of Moose Jaw describes. Broadview, en route to Valcarche, August 19, 1914. Stopped here for a while, and some school children who had a big goat with them were cheering us. Just in fun, someone asked the eldest girl if she would give us the goat for a mascot. Sure, take him along, and he'll bring you good luck. So we packed him aboard and took him to France. This new recruit would be known as Sergeant Bill, who was smuggled over to Europe and billeted with the men of the 5th Battalion, Western Cavalry. The pressures of the front were also being felt back at home in Saskatchewan. As the men of the province were leaving for overseas in increasing numbers, it left a void in the workforce that the men and women at home had to fill. At this time, many women's groups drew together to support the war effort, gathering supplies, joining the Red Cross, and supporting various war bond drives. These groups ranged in size from small community gatherings, such as the Motherwell Circle and the Tommy's Helpers, to larger organizations, such as the Women's Grain Growers Association. Maggie Kay, August 12, 1915, wrote, The girls of North Merrifield, feeling that something had to be done for the men who are so gallantly fighting for the Empire, met at the home of Mrs. Kay on August 12th and organized a branch of the St. John Ambulance Voluntary War Aid Association. Do not confuse us with the Canadian Red Cross. The Red Cross collects money only and sends it to headquarters while every cent the war aid receives is expended on field comforts for the soldiers and surgical shirts, gowns, bed jackets, etc. for the wounded. The women's suffrage movement had gained support during the war. Many women felt helpless as they sent their loved ones off to fight and had no political voice to protect their families. Violet McNaughton, from near Harris, Saskatchewan, helped organize the women's section of the Saskatchewan Grain Growers Association and became their first president. In order to effect a larger voice in the political theater, the Women's Grain Growers and the Women's Christian Temperance Union formed a partnership in February 1915 to work together to achieve women's suffrage. Violet McNaughton recalls the road to achieving the vote. We were now part and parcel of a powerful farm organization. We were the Saskatchewan Women Grain Growers. But there were still thousands of people, as well as the government, to be convinced that women were indeed persons. The task was difficult in those pre-radio and for so many of us, pre-telephone, pre-car days. We canvassed the country on foot, on horseback, stone boat, and by horse and buggy. We spoke from the back of wagons at prairie picnics, held, as Nellie McClung said, in the shade of a barbed wire fence. We invited the WCTU and newly organized equal franchise leagues in towns and cities to join forces with us. They did. Finally, in May 1915, Around a hundred representative men and women submitted a huge suffrage petition to Premier Walter Scott in the Saskatchewan Legislative Chamber. I recall sitting in the seat of the Honourable George Langley, and I thought with pride, if it hadn't been for the women grain growers, rural women would not be represented here today. Premier Scott was sympathetic. He promised us serious consideration. In the months that followed, the women's suffrage movement continued to gather more signatures to support their cause. Across to war-torn Europe, the 1st Canadian Division was deployed to France in February of 1915, and then were transferred to the Ypres Salient in Belgium in April. On the 22nd of April, the Germans released 5,730 canisters of chlorine gas over a four-mile front. It was the first use of poison gas on the Western Front. A French-Algerian division on the Canadians' left flank panicked and retreated, leaving a large gap in the line. The Canadians, seeing the threat to their flank, attacked into the gassed area. The troops combated the effects of the gas by urinating into handkerchiefs and wrapping them against their mouths, being as the ammonia in the urine helped to negate the chlorine agent. Descriptions of Battle of Ypres, April 23, 1915, Frederick Bagshaw. 
Shortly after 4 a.m., the OC 8th Battalion reported the fumes drifting across the German lines to trenches, sections 2 and 3. These fumes have an asphyxiating effect on the men. They become blue in the face and cannot breathe and soon become helpless. April 23, 1915, Ern Swanston. Passing through Wilts saw the most awful sight. Two Red Cross ambulances full of our wounded had been hit by a big shell and were laying on their sides, all smashed up and burning. The wounded were scattered all over the road. Many of them had been hit again and were screaming for help. The town was on fire, and I would have stopped my team to help them, but an officer said to get up onto the line with the ammunition. April 23, 1915, Robert Johnston. It was absolutely impossible to collect the wounded while the bombardment lasted, so we hurried down the street to a brick cellar which afforded a certain amount of protection. There were 20 of us, including three women and a couple of old men who stayed here all day. While shells of all description leveled the town, three shells hit the house and the buildings opposite to us killing five. April 24, 1915, Ern Swanston. Heavy fighting going on all around. It's just plain hell up there. Men and horses laying dead, limbers and motor trucks smashed, and the road all torn to pieces by shells. Eep and Wilts both on fire. Terrible sight. Over the next week, the Canadians were gassed again, but held the line until they were reinforced. Brigadier General A.W. Curry's report of the events of the Second Battle of Ypres. During the whole of these 22 days, the brigade was continuously under shell fire, day and night, losing 60% of their effective strength, without taking into account a considerable number of men who were admitted to hospital, suffering from the effects of the poisonous gas diffused by the enemy. The 13 days of the Second Battle of Ypres cost Canada 5,506 men. After the war, a memorial was erected in the Ypres battlefield to commemorate the Canadian sacrifice. Frederick Chapman Clemeshaw, an architect from Regina, designed the statue. Clemeshaw himself had served in the Canadian Corps and had been wounded in action. Clemeshaw's design comprised a single tower of stone with the head and shoulders of a soldier at the top of the tower. The sculpted figure has his head bowed and is in the pose of a serviceman standing with reversed arms. The iconic sculpture came to be called the Brooding Soldier. After the war, Clemeshaw's design was copied at the provincial legislature and the cenotaph in Regina's Victoria Park. After Second Ypres, the British committed the Canadians for a spring offensive, which comprised the battles of Festubert and Gavachy en goel The ground conditions were appalling, and it was impossible to surprise the enemy. The attack, which would last five days, would give the British control over a piece of land approximately 600 meters deep by one and a half kilometers wide. The price, another 2,323 Canadian casualties. Later, when the British asked the Canadians for other troops, Sam Hughes, who never missed an opportunity to point out the incompetence of the professionals, would comment on the events at Givenchy by saying that cattle rather than human beings should be provided for such fighting. As it turns out, Hughes was not far off the mark, as even the 5th Battalion's intrepid mascot, Billy the Goat, was gassed at Second Ypres and took a shrapnel wound at Festubert. It was not only on the battlefront that Saskatchewan was providing great efforts to support the war, but at the home front as well. The province produced one of the most successful crops in its history. Saskatchewan alone provided over half the wheat crop for all of Canada, the highest yield on record. The slogan, Patriotism and Production, had gained new meaning. After the bloodshed of the spring and summer, the Canadians serving in Belgium began a long period of static warfare, which would last them throughout the remainder of the year. In September, the arrival of the 2nd Canadian Division meant that a National Corps headquarters would be formed. From all this death and misery, an historic piece of Canadian poetry was created. John McRae served as an officer surgeon during the war, and on May the 3rd, after presiding over the burial of a close friend, he wrote a poem in order to help come to terms with the loss. After completing it, he discarded it, feeling it was unremarkable, but a colleague retrieved it and demanded that McRae submit it for publication. 
On December 8, 1915, Punch magazine first published McRae's In Flanders Fields, which has lived on to serve as one of the most popular commemorative poems of the Great War. <laughs> 